All right, we're on number five, section two, section two, uh, part B, number five. That just doesn't look good enough. Okay, that looks worse. Anyway, number five. Um, basically, what they give us is this differential equation, dB over dt is equal to one-fifth times 100 minus B. Okay, so if you look at that and then we reread the first paragraph, it starts to make some sense. This is the rate at which a bird is gaining weight. So that'd be uh, the baby bird's weight is uh, changing with respect to time. Right, so the rate at which the baby's weight is increasing is directly proportional to, remember if two things are di directly proportional, that means that one is equal to a constant times the other, or at least times a, a an expression where the other variable is involved. So if if y is say directly proportional to x, that means that y is equal to some constant times x. Okay, so if the rate at which it's changing is directly proportional to something, it's directly proportional means it's a constant multiple times the something. So it's directly proportional to the difference between its adult weight and its current weight. Um, so if we subtract its current weight from its adult weight, which would be 100 grams times one-fifth, then we will find how fast it's growing at that weight. Um, and they, they give you the information that at t equals zero, when they start measuring the baby's, baby bird's weight, um, it's 20. So that's actually this function here, b, the weight, is a function of time, and time is at zero at this moment and we get 20 grams, so b of 0 is 20, and they tell us that afterwards, okay? Um, so, and they're telling us that b is a function of time, so uh, b of t. So, in part a, it's asking us, is it growing faster when the weight is 40 grams or when it's 70? Well, to, since they give us the weight, we can find out how fast it's growing at each uh, each time. So the rate at which it's growing is at 40 grams equal to 100 minus 40 times 1 fifth. So that'd be 1 fifth times 60. That would be 12. And we could do it again for 70. dB, dt. Sorry about that. Uh, so dB, dt at 70 would be 1 fifth times 100 minus 70. That would be one fifth times thirty, and that would just be six. Okay, so since we put in forty and we got a greater rate of change than we did when we plugged in seventy, it must be growing faster here, faster at b of t equals forty. Okay, good enough, I think. B, uh, find the second derivative. That's what this means. The second derivative, well, that's what that notation you see there means. So to find the second derivative, you just take the derivative of the derivative. And here's the derivative. dB dt equals 1 fifth times 100 minus B. Uh, take the derivative of that, okay? The derivative of the derivative is equal to. Okay, so how do we take the derivative? Well, we got a function here. It's a function, it's not a function of b, so we don't just treat it like, oh, you know, b is the variable. We treat it like t is the variable, and b is a function of t, so we should really think b of t. So we're taking the derivative with respect to, to t, and so how would we do that? Um, well, we just need to, to treat it like this is not, um, the variable. B is not the variable. It's a function of t. Uh, so we have a function here. We're multiplying it by one-fifth. So we have first the constant multiple rule. We multiply one-fifth by the derivative of this. What's the derivative of this? Well, it's uh, the derivative, derivative of 100, which is 0, minus the derivative of b. Minus the derivative of b. Well, what's the derivative of b? It's just, it's just db dt, and it's, it's negative. It's negative db dt. And what's db dt? It's right there. So it's one-fifth times negative one-fifth 
uh, times 100 minus b. Okay, so 1 fifth times the derivative of this. The derivative of this is just negative db dt. db dt is already given to us. So in the end, negative 1 25th times 100 minus b. Okay, that's the second derivative. And they are wanting to know, why can, a, a, why can not a graph like this be the function that represents uh, b? Okay. So we have this function, uh, well, let's put b up here, b of t. Okay. And it's something. And it would have a graph of some kind. Um, so if, if we wanted to know stuff about this graph, we would take the derivative and the second derivative and ask questions like, where is the, where is the um, slope positive? Where is it negative? Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? What about concavity? All that kind of stuff. Um, so if we take the second derivative, and they said to use it to, to tell why this can't be the, the graph for b, the second derivative tells us about concavity. And what conclusions can we make about concavity based on this? Um, well, assuming that the baby bird always weighs something positive, um, that would be good. Uh, well, 100 minus b, this is going to be a positive number. It's also always going to be um, less than 100, because 100 is going to be its adult weight. So this is always going to be positive, and we're going to multiply it by this always negative number, and that means that for realistic values of b, um, the second derivative is always negative, which means that the, the graph of b would always be concave down. But right there, from here to there, it's concave up. So this couldn't be the, the graph of, uh, of b, because uh, the graph of b would be concave down for, uh, you know, well, we start at 20 at time 0 uh, to, well, 100 would be the limit on that. That would be its adult weight. Um, so for, for values between 20 and 100, this would be negative, and so it would be always concave down and therefore wouldn't have a section that's concave up. So that kind of invalidates that idea of that being the graph of B. Okay, last part, part C. Uh, so use the separation of variables to find y equals b of t. So just solve the differential equation um, and then find the particular solution when uh, we know that b of z is b of z. b of 0 is 20. Okay, so db dt equals 1 fifth times 100 minus b. So we got to separate the variables. Um, so probably the easiest thing would be to just multiply by dt on both sides and then divide by 100 minus b. So we get db over 100 minus b equals 1 fifth dt. Probably be the easiest thing to do. Um, so db over 100 minus b. Um, that is almost db over b, or, or, or du over u. If we were to take the antiderivative of both sides, uh, then this would almost be the derivative of the natural log. But we have this negative here. Right? So if we took the derivative of this, what we would get as the derivative would be negative db. So we're just going to put a negative right there. So we have the negative natural log the absolute value of 100 minus b. That's the antiderivative of this. And that is equal to, what's the, the antiderivative of 1 fifth dt? It would just be 1 fifth t. Okay. Um, so now the natural log of the absolute value of 100 minus b equals negative 1 fifth t. So e to the negative 1 fifth t is equal to 100 minus b and b would be equal
equal to 100 minus e to the negative one-fifth t. All right. And, uh, oh, of course, this would be plus c. Um, so this would be plus c. This would be plus c. And remember how we, uh, we allowed this to become something like, oh, let's just say k times e to the negative one-fifth t. Okay, so we'll use this as k. So now we know that this is b of t, and we know b of 0, which is 100 minus k times e to the negative 1 fifth times 0 should give us 20. And b of 0 then, uh, well, we don't need to write b of 0 anymore. Um, let's just look here. Uh, negative 1 fifth times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1. k times 1 is k. So 100 minus k equals 20. And so k is equal to 80. So the particular solution, given that b of 0 is 20, is 100 minus 80 times e to the negative 1 fifth t. So now we'll just move over and up and do number six. All right, and so for times between zero and 12, is basically what it says, for times between zero and 12, we have this function v of t equals the cosine of pi over six times t. And this function tells us the velocity of a particle moving along the x-axis. This is a pretty uh, standard question to ask about a particle moving around on the graph. Um, and it does tell us that when t equals 0, x is negative 2. That means the particle is at negative 2. That won't be quite useful yet, but it will be soon enough. So part 8 asks, when is the particle moving left? What does it mean to be moving left? What, is it, what does it mean about the velocity if you're moving left? Well, if you're moving to the left, your velocity would be considered negative because these positions are positive, and to move toward negative positions, you have to be moving left, and so your velocity has to be negative. So if we set this equal to 0, then we can find those breaking points, like it would have to cross 0 to go from positive to negative, and so on. Okay, so then pi over 6, t equals the inverse cosine of 0. Okay. And really what we're trying to find is what, ang or what, uh, yeah, what angle has a cosine of 0, um, but it could be any angle uh, that makes this equation true. Right? Uh, we want to find all the values of t between 0 and 12 that make this equation true. Um, so the inverse cosine of 0, or the angle that has a cosine of 0, is pi over 2. But also, uh, if you look at your unit circle, not just pi over 2, but 3 pi over 2 has a cosine of 0, uh, and 5 pi over 2, and 7 pi over 2, and 9 pi over 2. All these angles have a cosine of 0. And we just have to go halfway around a circle, so we can add any multiple of pi to find another angle that has a cosine of 0. So to solve for t, we'd multiply by 6 over pi on both sides. t equals pi over 2 plus n pi times 6 over pi. Uh, multiply that will just cancel out the pi's, and so we'll wind up with 6 over 2 plus, and the pi's cancel, 6n. So t equals, what did I just write, 6 over 2. So 3 plus 6n. So any t value that is 3 seconds plus any multiple of 6 will be valid. So at t equals 3, or t equals 9, or t equals, well, that puts us past 12 seconds if we add 6 to this. So we're good. 3 and 9 would be the places uh, that it basically turns around. But that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Is it turning around from going positive to negative or negative to positive? So kind of got to test it out. Um, 
So let's look at some values on the left and right of 3 and the left and right of 9. Um, uh, maybe we'll go like this. And like this. So at negative, or not negative, at 3 and at 9. Um, what's the you know what's the derivative on the left of three? Uh, so we put mm, zero into the cosine. Cosine of zero is one. That's positive. So we got uh, positive velocity. It's going up like that, um, or it's going to the right. And if we put in a number like four, that's probably the easiest to do. Four. That's going to be um, 2 pi over 3. What's the cosine of 2 pi over 3? It's uh, negative 1 half, so it's negative. And then we go past 9. Let's go to 10. So that's going to be 5 pi over 3. So the cosine of 5 pi over 3 is, um, let's see, put in 10. So that's positive one half. So it's then positive again. Um, so we see that it's going at a positive velocity here, at negative velocity or positive velocity here. So right here, it's moving left. All right, so between three and nine, it's moving left. So the answer would be for values that are between three and nine, and I guess not right at three because that's where it stopped. So between 3 and 9, it is moving to the left. OK, for part B. They're asking um, us to write but not evaluate an integral expressing uh, expression that gives the total distance traveled by the particle from the time t equals 0 to time t equals 6. Um, so a few things to consider. Um, first of all, we should understand that this relationship between derivative and, and uh, definite integral. Uh, if you take the derivative of the position function, you get velocity. Derivative of velocity is acceleration. De derivative of acceleration is jerk. If we go the other way, the definite integral on an interval uh, from, from A to B on jerk, so the definite integral of jerk takes you back to how much the acceleration has changed. The definite integral of acceleration tells you how much the velocity has changed. Definite integral of velocity tells you how much the distance has changed. Okay, so we want to take the definite integral of velocity to understand what's happened to the position or the distance. Um, so we'll take v of t uh, equals cosine of pi over 6t. Uh, and we'll take the antiderivative of it to find out how much the the distance has changed. Okay, so that's the first thing. It's just a reminder that when we want to know if we know the velocity, we want to know that we want to know the distance. We're talking about antiderivative or the definite integral. Um, so the other thing is it wants to know the total distance traveled, um, not the displacement. You know, not it went three steps forward and took two steps back, so it took a total of you know, one step. It wants to know it took three steps forward and two steps back, so it went five steps. Um, so if we take the, the definite integral from um, three to six, since we know that between three and nine it's moving backwards, basically, then we're going to wind up taking distance off. So here's what we want to do. We want to take the definite integral from zero to three, because at all those times it's moving forward. So that's what we want to do. Um, and then we would think maybe we would add the, the definite integral from 3 to 6 of this function. But remember, oh, they definitely want to see the dt's there, so don't forget that. Um, if we take this definite integral, we're going to get a negative distance because it's moving with a negative velocity. Right? So to make this positive, we'll switch the limits and subtract. Or, uh, 
you could just say, well, I'll, I'll take the, the definite integral of this and just say, well, it's negative, so I'll make it positive and add it. It does the same thing. Um, so, let's see. No, we don't want to do that. We want to add this. We want to take this, which is negative, make it positive, and then add it. And that's it, because uh, it says that we're supposed to write but not evaluate. So be glad not to evaluate that. Um, part C. Um, find the acceleration of the particle at time t. OK, well, velocity, take the derivative, you get acceleration, right? So uh, take the derivative of velocity, that's the acceleration. So what's that going to be? That's going to be negative sine of pi over 6 t. And then the chain rule says we need to multiply by the derivative of this function, which would be pi over 6. So we could do negative pi over 6 sine of pi over 6 t. OK. Um, so we're supposed to use this to find out if the speed of the particle is increasing, decreasing, or neither at time t equals 4. Explain your reasoning. So um, if you notice, it's, it's asking you if the, the speed is increasing. It's not asking you if the velocity is increasing. Um, so velocity would um, pay attention to the direction. It would pay attention to the sign of uh, the speed. OK, so velocity would be um, you know, increasing if it's going in the positive direction, basically. But speed, it doesn't matter which direction you're going. If you have a bigger number, you're going faster. You have more speed. So we want to look at, is, is the magnitude of the velocity uh, getting bigger, or the absolute value of the, of the velocity getting bigger, or is it getting smaller? Okay. Um, so at time 4, that's what they want to know about. So the acceleration at time 4 is negative pi over 6 sine pi over 6 times 4. And that's negative pi over 6 times the sine of 2 pi over 3, if we cancel the 4 and the 6, and get 2 and 3, 2 pi over 3. And the sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. So we get, well, it doesn't even matter. We get a negative. That's all that matters. The acceleration is negative. So there's two ways that your acceleration could be negative. Basically, two scenarios where your uh, acceleration be negative. Either you're moving in a, um, a positive direction, and you're hitting the brakes, and so you're decelerating. You're changing your velocity uh, to bring you to closer to a stop. Or you're moving in a negative direction already. You're driving in, re in reverse or whatever, and you're giving it more gas. Uh, you're, you're going in the negative direction, and you're going in that negative direction faster and faster. Okay, So um, if we were going in the negative direction and we had a negative acceleration, then we would, um, we would be going faster. Our speed would be increasing. Um, our velocity would be decreasing, right? And if we were to just look at this, we'd say, well, our, our velocity is decreasing. We're, we're slowing down. Or, or rather, we're, we're going more and more uh, in a negative speed, negative velocity. Uh, but for speed, it doesn't matter. Speed is just how fast. Positive, negative doesn't matter, just how fast. So we'll look at the velocity at 4. If it's positive, that means this negative acceleration is slowing us down. If we're uh, going negative velocity, it means that this acceleration, this negative acceleration, is making us go negative even faster and faster and faster. Okay. So v of 4 is the cosine of pi over 6t. t is 4. Uh, that's the cosine of, um, of, pi, of 2 pi over 3, and that's negative 1 half. 
So its velocity is negative, the acceleration is negative, so it's moving in the negative direction even faster and faster as time goes on. Uh, so, um, yeah, its speed is increasing. Its velocity technically is decreasing because the more negative velocity, the smaller your velocity. Um, but speed doesn't care. Speed just cares about going fast. That's why it's very, very dangerous. Uh, okay, apparently there's something that's gone wrong in my computer somewhere, but we're going to ignore it. Uh, find the position of the particle at time t equals 4. Um, I guess there's a couple different ways we could do this, um, but the one that comes to mind is we have a way to find how much the velocity has changed over a time interval. Um, and not only that, we know its position at a given time, time equals zero. Uh, and so we could find that change in distance and then uh, add it to that position that we already know. Okay, is that confusing enough? Uh, at time t equals zero, we know that the particle is at x equals negative two. And if we can find out how much, how, uh, how much the velocity has changed, um, or the sorry, the uh, the distance has changed, then we can just add it to negative two. Okay, and if we take the definite integral from zero, starting at zero, to four, that'll tell us. It'll take everything into account: positive velocities, negative velocities. It'll just tell us uh, overall what's the displacement, basically. It took three steps forward, two steps back, so it took one step. And if you know it took one step, then we know it's at negative one. Okay, but first we have to actually do this. So we'll take the definite integral of the cosine of pi over 6t dt. Don't forget dt's. Um, so this, it almost looks like we take the antiderivative of this, and it would be the sine, because the derivative of sine is cosine. But clearly, there would be some uh, chain rule involved. Uh, so if we were to take the derivative of the sine of pi over 6t, like if this were our antiderivative that we're going to evaluate from 0 to 4, well, we would have to be able to take the derivative of this and get cosine of pi over 6t, but we wouldn't. We would get sine of, uh, well, the derivative of sine of pi over 6t would be cosine of pi over 6t times pi over 6, because we have the chain rule. So We'll do pi over 6, and we'll do 6 over pi. Uh, and then we will have 6 over pi times this guy right here. 6 over pi times the definite integral uh, of, of this from 0 to 4. So there it is. And so we have 6 over pi times the sine of, what are we going to get when we plug 4 in there? 4 is going to give us 2 pi over 3. Put in 0, we're going to get 0. Um, the sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And the sine of 0 is 0. Um, so, let's see, you can Cancel this 2 and the 6, give us 3, gives us 3 root 3 over pi. Okay, And that's just how much it's changed. So uh, we'll add it to negative 2. So negative 2 plus that much change. Uh, that, that'd be it. Like That's a, a totally acceptable answer to the, uh, to the readers. Uh, and by readers, I mean graders. Um, I guess the other way we could have done it was uh, they're asking us about the distance, right, or the, or, the, or the position. So if we had a position function that we could plug into, uh, we could do it. Um, so we could take, I guess it'd be pretty much the same, wouldn't it? Um, but we could take the antiderivative of the velocity function, get the position function, um, which would have a plus c in it, okay, right? Because we just took the antiderivative, um, but 
again, we have this specific information so we can find the particular function um, that, and, and this would be the function sine, uh, or uh, let's see, 6 over pi times sine of pi over 6t, um, and then we it would have a plus c there, and we can plug in uh, 0 for t and know that that would result in negative 2 and find c. This sounds terrible. I would not do that. Uh, this this was much better. Uh, find the change in distance, add it to uh, a given distance at a given time, and you have where that particle must be. Okay. Um, and it's just, isn't this incredible that you can take the antiderivative of this thing and evaluate from 0 to 4, and you just know how far it's gone. Uh, even including from 3 to 4, it's going in a negative direction. It has a negative velocity. Uh, and just this simple calculation takes all that into account. So, marvel. Um, that is it. That's the, the, the last question there. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed that. I enjoyed making it. And I'm going to stop talking. You guys continue to enjoy your weekend.